I'm from the Vossa Museum in Stockholm uh, and following in the great 17th century tradition of the long conflict between Denmark and Sweden, I'm a foreign mercenary who offered his services to both sides. <laughs> when I left the National Museum of Denmark in 2003 to go to the Vossa Museum, my colleagues accused me of going over to the enemy. <laughs> Uh, the sites we've been hearing about so far today uh, are fortresses, or as I like to think of them, targets, uh, which uh, have a basically defensive nature. Uh, and so my job uh, at Klaus's insistence was to provide the offensive counterpart to this, uh, and that is to look at the weapons that were used to uh, attack fortresses. Uh, this is a result of a project that we carried out at the Vossa Museum in 20 2012 to 2014, which was not originally uh, oriented towards siege warfare, uh, but towards naval warfare. Uh, this, is the this is the contemporary image today of what naval warfare in the age of sail was like. Extra points if you can identify all three films. Uh, but we happen to have a more or less intact warship from the 17th century, from the period of the Thirty Years' War, uh, sitting in our museum. Uh, here's some basic statistical information about it, uh, and it's mostly original timber. Uh, it was built in the 1620s in the reign of Gustav Adolf, Gustav II, uh, who uh, is a contemporary to Christian IV. Uh, unlike Christian IV, he was not a great builder of buildings. Uh, he built armies and navies instead. Uh, and so the ship was originally intended to be armed with 72 bronze guns, but what the, they discovered is that you can build ships faster than you can cast cannon. Uh, and so the ship eventually sailed eight guns short uh, of that armament with only 64. What's relevant here is that the primary weapon, the primary uh, battery on the ship, consisted of 48 24 pounder bronze guns. 46 of these were a new pattern light 24 pounder that had been developed not as a naval gun but as mobile siege artillery. Uh, it had been intended as a new lightweight type of 24 pounder that would be road portable uh, for the unimproved roads uh, of the war at that time uh, that Sweden was engaged in against Poland and Lithuania. It has bore of 146 millimeters. It fires a ball that weighs 10 kilograms on average, although there's some variation. Uh, and the gun itself weighs about 1,250 kilograms, plus a carriage that weighs a little short of 400 kilograms. Uh, for comparison, total, the total weight is about the same as a Mercedes S-Class. Uh, this gun was uh, then adapted into naval usage, and it became a standard weapon both in the Navy and the Swedish Army. So the armies that Gustav Adolf took to Germany in the 1630s, and with which he attacked uh, fortresses across Germany and fought uh, field actions, uh, depended in large part on guns of this pattern as heavy artillery. Uh, it's part of a program of standardization that characterized Gustav Adolf's reign. Uh, instead of a very wide range of uh, artillery types made in singles and twos and threes, uh, he insisted on a standardization on just four sizes of gun. Uh, so that ammunition would be interchangeable between guns, the supply process would be much simpler, and the manufacturing process would be standardized. Uh, this particular gun, there are 12 surviving examples, three from Balsa and four from another shipwreck, Cronin, uh, and measurement shows that they all have the same bore to within a half a millimeter. It's a very high standardization in manufacture of the gun. The ammunition, however, varies uh, in its diameter from 135 to 143 millimeters. You couldn't make the ammunition as accurately as you could make the guns. It was also, in this time, in naval terms, a weapon in search of tactics. People understood that more guns were better, and big guns were better than small guns. But effective naval tactics had not yet been developed to employ massed, concentrated fire of artillery uh, at sea. Uh, it was starting, people were starting to adapt this methodology on land, but also a, a, an increasing approach on land was what we would call, call today combined arms tactics and that is better coordination between uh, infantry, cavalry, and artillery. And Gustav Adolf was one of the pioneers of implementing this kind of uh, strategy, to use your artillery more effectively and more co uh, coordinated uh, with the other arms. The test that we wanted to do was, in some senses, conventional ordnance testing. We wanted to assess three different characteristics of this particular gun in order to get a better idea of how you might have used a ship like Vossa in battle. Vossa is a new experimental type of warship in the 1620s for the Swedish Navy in that it has much heavier guns and a large number of guns, and in fact two full decks armed with identical guns, the first ship in history with what you could call a unitary armament. 
uh, and we'd like to know what the performance of the individual gun is and how you might be able to use that ship in battle. And so we were looking at three factors. Uh, ballistics, which is basically range and accuracy, or how far can you shoot and can you hit what you aim at. Uh, effect, and that is what happens when you do hit what you aim at. Uh, and that involves penetration, fragmentation, uh, and then what kind of damage do you do, both to the structure you're shooting at and to the people who are inside the structure. And it's important to remember here that in naval tactics of the period, the goal was not to destroy an enemy ship, it was to capture it. Uh, for strategic reasons, it changes the balance of power by two instead of one. You don't just reduce your enemy's forces, you increase your own. And so you're looking for weapons that will damage the crew effectively and quickly without damaging the ship beyond the point where it can be repaired effectively. And finally, we, we want to look at ergonomics. In, in tactical terms is the loading and firing rate, but also how does this weapon affect the people who are firing it? What kind of noise levels are you experiencing? Vibration, what kind of risks do you run by standing next to a Mercedes S-Class recoiling at uh, 15 kilometers an hour? This is the copy of the tube uh, in uh, bronze. Uh, it's a high copper bronze. Uh, the Swedish Navy called these copper guns. Uh, the English Navy, by uh, comparison, uh, had a much more uh, higher tin content, and they called their guns brass as a result. So this is about 4.5% tin bronze. It's a pretty tough and forgiving metal. Uh, and we also, because we had the entire artillery system preserved, could make accurate copies of the carriages, uh, of the loading and aiming equipment, of the ammunition. We have these four types of solid shot. Uh, this is what you would find on land as well, with common round shot. These are specialized shot developed for marine applications. They're for attacking rigging at different ranges. This is long range against rigging, that's short range against rigging. Um, this was sometimes used on land as well against uh, troops. A fifth type that we also tested was case shot, which is a wooden tube full, full of several hundred musket balls, which turns your cannon into a giant shotgun, uh, and was by far the most feared ammunition among crews, because there was no way to hide from it. Gunpowder was an issue here uh, because no one actually knows what 17th century gunpowder is or what kind of performance it has. We have another project ongoing now to try to investigate that. However, ballistic uh, tables or gunner's tables from the time tell us what the muzzle velocities were or we can calculate what they were. And so all we need is a propellant that will generate the same muzzle velocity, the speed the ball leaves the gun uh, in order to be accurate. And we know the size of the charges because we have the remains of the transport tubes for taking charges up to the guns. So we used a modern powder formulated to give similar performance to what we think we had in the 17th century and then reduced the charge size until we got the right ball speed. We also needed a target. In this case, we were a ship target. Uh, and we, so we built a section of balsa uh, about four meters long, three and a half meters high. It weighs eight tons uh, and, so, and is built as an exact copy of part of the lower gun deck of the ship. There have been other uh, tests of reproduced artillery fired at what was claimed to be ship size, which are mostly generic walls of timber. They don't reflect the actual construction of a ship, which turns out to be very important. The amount of damage you do, do the single most important factor is exactly where you hit the structure, not how fast the ball is going, not how big the ball is. This is that uh, section being uh, built by the shipwrights at the museum. And you need a gun crew. Uh, one of the things about experimental archaeology is uh, what are you testing? Are you testing the hardware or are you testing the software? Are you testing your own ability to use it? And because if you're sailing Viking ships, we don't grow up sailing Viking ships anymore. Do we have the necessary skill set to evaluate the technology? Or are we only evaluating our own ability to use it? Uh, and so at the Viking Ship Museum in Denmark, where I worked for several years, we didn't attempt to evaluate the ship's performance until its third sailing season, till we had gotten good enough at sailing it that we could figure out what the ship would do, not just what we could do. Uh, and so we needed to do the same thing for shooting this cannon. Of course, it's not, hard to, it's not easy to find people who grow up shooting muzzle-loading cannon, <laughs> unless you go to the United States, uh, where among all of those Trump-supporting gun nuts, uh, there is a subset who compete regularly with muzzle-loading artillery. <laughs> and so they have many, many years of experience. So we brought in the 2011 national champions in mortar 
uh, as our gun crew. <laughs> Which is easy to do because on one <laughs> Full instrumentation so that you can actually analyze what you're doing, not just making a nice bang for the cameras. Doppler radar to measure speed uh, and even uh, measure the internal pressure inside the gun. And uh, working with the Defense Research Institute using modern techniques for assessing internal splinter damage to see what kind of damage you do to the people inside the ship. The gun was proofed, in other words, to prove it was safe to work it. Uh, and this, from this we were able to derive a working charge of 2.65 kilograms. The official charge in that time would have been 3 kilograms for this gun. The program of fire took two weeks to carry out, included 54 rounds overall. Uh, we used over 125 kilograms of gunpowder. Asked me some time about buying hundreds of kilograms of gunpowder and getting it transported from Germany to Sweden. <laughs> Uh, and after the gun crew had uh, developed a loading uh, procedure following the official naval uh, method of the time, adapted for safety considerations, uh, we were able to carry out the firing trials. So that's round number 33 out of 54, uh, which is a, that's a 2.65 kilogram charge. What we discovered is that we could easily reach uh, muzzle velocities that were transonic, about 360 meters per second, uh, but this is ineffective. You really want, for this type of gun, a muzzle velocity that is high subsonic. A sphere is absolutely the worst possible shape in the transonic region. A cube flies better across the sound barrier than a sphere does. Uh, and so a high subsonic round will actually travel far farther than a transonic round. You need to get up to about Mach 1.5 to actually get better range. And that's what guns of the later 17th century did. But still, at a range, an elevation of 3 degrees, point blank, this gun will fire up at that ball 1,000 meters. And if you could elevate the gun to its maximum, you'd get about 4 kilometers of range. Although at that range, you'd have, hit, you'd have trouble accurately hitting something the size of Stockholm. <laughs> This is the accuracy picture at 20 meters from the muzzle. So you have a spread that's about 50 centimeters across. If you extend that out, but occasionally you get lucky. You can sometimes hit the bullseye. <laughs> or as we call it, blind pigs find the acorn every now and then. Uh, but uh, then that's called a cake shot at the proving range, because you have to buy cake for the technical staff if you do that. <laughs> If you extend that out to 1,000 meters, this is the spread you get over a target the size of Boston. That looks like it's pretty good, doesn't it? The problem is, at 1,000 meters, the height of the side of the ship, in terms of the angle of elevation at sub 10s, is 0 0.2 degrees. And you're firing off of a ship that's rolling 6 degrees. There's no way you can accurately hit something that far away with this gun, or any gun. In addition, you have to aim the gun there to get the ball to drop here. This is much more effective as a siege weapon uh, at longer range because you're firing at a much bigger and stationary target. Even at a thousand meters, however, it's got plenty of punch. This hit one of the reinforcing uh, I-beams on one of the target frames at a thousand meters after this ball had hit the ground and skipped up. This is a spent round. Most of the time, the ball wins. Uh, about 90% uh, of the balls fired into the backstop, which was granite, broke up the stone. Uh, and about 10% of the case, it shattered the ball. So this is an effective weapon against stone fortification. It's even more effective against the side of a ship. Bullseye. This is a high velocity round hitting the thinnest part of the side of the ship. Notice, it's all small splinters. This is the ball hitting. You can see the transonic pressure wave behind it. And you can see that the cloud of splinters is ahead of the ball. That's because it's not the ball that's doing the damage. It's the pressure wave or shock wave ahead of the ball going through the material that does the damage. That's important to remember if you want to understand what's actually happening inside your wooden or stone structure. 
and also why the exit hole is much bigger than the entry hole. That ball, however, after it hit the ship side, continued another 500 meters before it hit the ground, skipped up, traveled 200 meters through the forest, limbing trees, and bullseyed a 40 centimeter pine tree, cutting it in half. Spent ammunition. Now if you fire a slower round and it hits the big timbers on the inside of the ship, this is what happens. All of those small splinters of the first round are largely harmless. And in fact, we discovered that the wool clothing of the time will deflect 90% of them. It won't do anything about this, however. Which is why, and the difference in where that ball hits was only 20 centimeters in this structure. This is the size of those splinters. Bone crushing, jagged wound causing splinters. This is what the outside of the ship looked like when we were done. A lot of small holes. In fact, 12. We also managed to fire one straight through the open gun port. <laughs> well, we also managed to fire straight through an already existing hole with one shot, too. Blind pigs find the acorn. This is what the inside looks like. And all of this is what you're after. This wounds people. This is the damage you're trying to do to a ship. It's a completely different tactical environment than if you're firing at a fortress. You're trying to batter walls into submission with a fortress. So what we were able to say, that in addition to this being a lot of fun, more fun than people should really be allowed to have, <laughs> we're also much more aware of this the tactical environment and what the possible results are. We also know that this helps to explain why casualties in warships are much smaller than we would think for two ships pounding the daylights out of each other for hours at a time. There's an enormous amount of random chance involved in the damage done based on where it hits the structure, as well as the speed of the ball, how large the ball is. But a ball this size is unstoppable. We could not fire around slow enough to get the ship side to stop it. And every single round not only went through it, but had a high enough exit velocity that it would go out the other side as well. So it's an effective weapon, and also it helps to explain why eventually fortifications became obsolete. Thank you.